What did Jim's card say? When did Pam trade the iPod? And what really happened at the Christmas party? In part three of Gay Jimothy on the Anti-Strangling Task Force. Part two, we worked out that Pam had the card before she got the teapot and we made a major discovery. That discovery being that there are actually three different envelopes. We have Jim's OG envelope, then we have the second envelope that he puts in his back pocket and the third and final envelope is the one that he gives back to Pam opened in season nine. In this episode, we're gonna establish the final building blocks of the story and try to put together a working hypothesis hypothesis because the Scranton Strangler puzzle regarding the teapot is quite specific and nuanced. Now when I say building blocks, I mean the ingredients of the real series of events that happened in this episode. And to do this, we're gonna create a police investigation mind map. You know how the police will put together all the images and ideas and references on the same board and then connect it all together to try and make sense of it. We're gonna do exactly the same thing. So let's start with what we've already worked out in chronological order. The first building block of our series of events is Jim putting the OG card with the OG envelope into the box. Then we have Dwight receiving the box still with the card inside. The teapot is then seen without the box in the conference room. Following this, the card is seen at reception while Pam and Roy are playing with the iPod. Dwight is seen doing the robot with the empty box, then Pam has the teapot. In that same moment, Jim then takes back the teapot card and puts it into his back pocket. And remember, that card has a different label. It's enclosed in a different envelope. Then to fast forward to season nine, Jim returns what is assumed to be a different card in an open envelope, again with a different label. This is the third teapot envelope. So these are the major building blocks that we have so far, but we are missing a couple. What we're gonna work out in this episode is exactly what was written in the card, and we're going to establish the moment that the iPod was traded for the teapot. So we're gonna work these two elements out in isolation, add them to our mind map, and then try to put it together into a narrative that makes sense. So what did the card say? Believe it or not, Task Force, the creators do actually give us this information in the episode itself. But as per usual, it's not done explicitly, but rather it's done symbolically. The contents of the teapot are in fact the contents of the Christmas card. And this actually counts as one of the many Scranton Strangler puzzles in the show. For those who've been following the investigation closely, you'll know that we have encountered this method of communication in the past. A few good examples include the intro sequence. The intro sequence is telling us the story prior to the documentary crew arriving. Another good example is Christian Slater's Sabre video, with a Sabre video of course being a riddle and something that we had to work out. Now this is a similar situation. To work out what the Christmas card said, we need to interpret the contents of the teapot symbolically. So the contents of the teapot are as follows. We have a cassette mixtape. We have a high school photo of Jim. This is my high school yearbook photo. She's out at the party and it really makes her laugh. We have a boggle timer. Is this the boggle timer? I didn't think you were gonna get that one. Two packets of hot sauce. This is a hot sauce packet. She put this on a hot dog a couple years ago because she thought it was ketchup. So I kept the other two. And a tiny pencil. Wait. So what does it all mean? This is where understanding the strong motif around Jim actually being gay becomes critical. After all, this is part three of Gay Jimothy. And this is why the teapot letter is part of the Gay Jimothy series. So the first item is a mixtape. Now you have to keep in mind, guys, it's, it's relatively interesting that he is actually giving her a tape to begin with. At this stage, we're in the mid 2000s and we're already moving to iPods. It would be a lot more likely that it would have been a CD, just like how Michael puts together a, a mix on CD for Holly. And that's the point. We're not dealing with an actual mixtape. In this case, we're actually dealing with a play on words. Remember when Michael makes the Buddha butter joke? Buddha. Buddha who? 
boot of this bread for me, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> this is a similar situation. It's a play on the word mixtape. Mixtape mixed up. What Jim is really saying is that he's feeling mixed up. So the card starts like this. Dear Pam, I'm feeling mixed up. Well, mixed up about what? It's the second item that now continues the letter for us. Second item is a high school picture of Jim. Now this one's actually gonna make a lot more sense when we cover the theme of the show, which those videos are gonna come out soon. There's still quite a bit I gotta do on those videos, guys, right? Cause I'm, I'm going to be appearing on camera for those bunch of videos, right? So I'm not quite ready yet to finish that series, but once we cover the theme, the interpretation of this photo is gonna be a lot simpler. But to give you the interpretation, what you're seeing here is gay Jimothy. Jim realized he was gay whilst at high school. So this constitutes the second part of the card. We have, Dear Pam, I'm feeling mixed up. I realized in high school that I was gay. The next item in the teapot is the boggle timer. Now for those who might not know, a boggle timer is exactly three minutes. So again, we have another echo of the curse of three. Any link to the curse of three is a direction by the creators for us to pay attention to that clue. In this case, we're paying attention to the contents of the teapot. Now the boggle timer is symbolic of time and specifically the amount of time spent with Pam. Because as Jim spent so much time at reception talking to Pam, he's starting to get mixed up feelings about his sexuality. So the card now looks like this. Dear Pam, I'm feeling mixed up. Ever since high school, I knew I was gay. However, I've been spending a lot of time with you. And this is what now brings us to the two packets of hot sauce. When someone has the sauce, it's a colloquialism for, for you finding them hot or sexually attractive. And that's why it's hot sauce. But there's two packets of hot sauce. And this is symbolic of Jim finding both sexes attractive. He's now finding men sexually attractive, but because of his time spent with Pam, he's now also finding women sexually attractive. Remember that conversation that Jim has with Andy? You gotta have sex with a woman. Pray to hell, not a man. Not compare. We're sort of getting an echo of that conversation, and for those who have followed the investigation closely, you'll know that Andy is actually symbolic of Jim's inner character. So that discussion he has with Andy is really a discussion he's having with himself. But now we're getting that same discussion sort of externalized in his card to Pam. So now he's finding women attractive. So now the card looks like this. Dear Pam, I'm feeling mixed up. Ever since high school, I knew I was gay. However, we've spent a lot of time together and now I think I find both men and women attractive. Now the final item is the pencil. Some time ago, I released a video called Pencil Equals Penis. In this short video, it was revealed that pencils are actually symbolic of penises in the office. We saw that Kevin had quite a girthy pencil, whereas Michael had a very large pencil on his desk. We also see Jim's pencil in this episode, and it's a tiny pencil, meaning that Jim is... Ah, uh, the guy with a tiny penis. So he's giving her his pencil. And this is the final item he puts in the teapot, which is the final bit in the Christmas card. So the whole card goes like this. Dear Pam, I'm feeling mixed up. Ever since high school, I knew I was gay, but I've been spending a lot of time with you. And now I think I find men and women attractive. I want to have sex with you.
is the contents of the card, finally revealed, disguised symbolically with the contents of the teapot. So now that we've gotten to the end of the card, you'll understand why it's critical to have knowledge of the motif of homosexuality and Jim's character. You cannot decipher the card unless you are already conscious of that reality. So the contents of the card now forms one of our building blocks in our police mind map. We're gonna now fast forward to the second envelope. Now I did imply at the end of part two of Gay Jimothy that it was Dwight who actually labeled the second envelope. And the primary evidence for that at this stage is the similarity in the M on the second envelope to the way that Dwight writes M in his book of lists. If we compare how Jim writes M's in his Pam CC baby note, it is inconsistent with the M on the second envelope. When we compare the M to Pam's note she gives to Jim when he's into interviewing for the job at corporate, it is also inconsistent with the second envelope. But comparing it to the M in Dwight's book of lists seems to be the most accurate and strongest link to who relabeled and resealed the card in the second envelope. It's also interesting to note that the second envelope seems as though it has a Y written in it. So rather than just having Pam, it seems as though we have Pammy written. Now throughout the series, I've done a search of the script script or the excel sheet that we have with all the lines, the only three characters who call Pam Pammy are Michael, Roy and Helene. So what appears to have happened is that Dwight has sealed and labeled the second envelope but written Pammy to try and perhaps throw off Jim if he notices that it's been re-enclosed and obviously to throw him off into thinking that it was Roy who opened the card and it was Roy who resealed it. So this building block obviously fits somewhere before Jim takes the card back. We're talking about the resealing and relabeling of the card by Dwight Schrute. So as I'm sure many of you are noticing already, Task Force, the plot is thickening, right? It's not just that it's been opened. It's now been resealed, relabeled. Dwight is now involved and they're actively trying to cover this up by trying to sort of point the finger at Roy. We're now going to rewind from this moment and go to the iPod trade, the moment when Pam and Dwight actually traded the gifts. Now it's a good time to mention guys that I have actually made a mistake in the photo timeline. I know I released that video last week but as this is an ongoing investigation there's obviously going to be rehashes and mistakes and I've noticed I've made actually a significant mistake in the timeline. So let's quickly point that out, fix it and then move on to the trade. The order that I displayed in the video was like this. Shot of vodka, Jim and Ryan, Jim and Ryan again, another shot of vodka and then Jim and Ryan. Now this is actually wrong and it's wrong because I haven't considered Daryl and Roy's position in each photo and I haven't considered Angela leaving the scene in this series of photos. You'll notice in the video footage of the episode that Daryl and Roy rejoin the party from the kitchen whilst the shots are being taken. So we now know that the photos of Michael and Meredith taking shots were taken next to each other because we don't have Daryl and Roy in the photo yet. So the first photo in the timeline is Michael and Meredith having taken the shot and the second photo would appear to be Michael and Meredith taking another shot of vodka. Then we have the photo of Jim and Ryan with Daryl and Roy arriving to the scene. The photo following this is Jim and Ryan with Angela in the background and then in the final photo we can see Angela leaving. Here on the right hand side Angela is now leaving the scene. So this is actually the correct timeline of this batch of photos. So my apologies for the mistake but we now have rectified that. Now task force, this is exactly where the iPod was traded. If you look at the footage in slow motion, you'll notice Pam and Dwight are in the background. Dwight is just outside the conference room and we can see a glimpse of Pam facing him. Then Michael takes the photo of him and Meredith. Then he takes the second photo of him and Meredith. Now in this photo, you can clearly see Dwight holding the teapot. No box and no car. In addition to this, he's also looking at Pam. Now we know she's there because of the video footage, but we can't see her in the photo. Now it's 
a really important photo in our investigation, guys, because our whole hypothesis was based around the fact that Pam did not receive the card with the teapot. That is now officially confirmed by the evidence. Dwight is not holding the card, he is not holding the box, he is just holding the teapot. And we know that the card was not in the teapot, right? So this is like your definitive evidence that the card and teapot were not traded together. So to jump back to the video footage, we then see Daryl and Roy joining the party. Angela is annoyed in the background. Then in the next photo taken, we can still see Dwight in the background, but we're not able to sort of deduce any further information from this photo. Then we have the second photo of Jim and Ryan with Angela still in the background annoyed. Then we have the final photo. On the right hand side, Angela is leaving the scene. She's obviously had enough of all the alcoholism. She's super annoyed. She leaves. But if we scan to the left, you'll notice that Dwight no longer has the teapot, but he's now holding the iPod. The transaction has been complete. Now this photo is really important as well because Dwight continues to look at Pam. Now this suggests that the discussion is continuing between the two. He seems to look quite concerned. She definitely has Dwight's attention here. So we're very interested in the discussion that they're having whilst everybody else is distracted. And we will come back to that. But that now formulates our next building block in our police mind map. That's a big deal, guys. We, up until now, no one has been able to show you the moment that the trade has occurred. And from that fact, a lot of misconceptions have spawned, you know, like the letter came out of the teapot or the card was traded with the teapot in the box. And we now have physical, photographic and video evidence that that is definitively not what's occurred. Now, the final building block we're going to put into this mix is when Pam read the card. Now, we did touch on this in part two, but we're just going to briefly review that information here. We know Pam has the card at reception while she's playing with the iPod and Roy's with her. Now it's unlikely that she read the card in front of Roy. If she had read the card in front of Roy, we may have had a different reaction from Roy in the episode The Negotiation. I just thought you guys were really good friends or maybe he was gay or something. Not that that's wrong. So she doesn't read it in front of Roy. What she likely does is continue to set the iPod up, plug it into her computer and start loading songs up onto the iPod. Remember, when Dwight gets the iPod, he's listening to some music later on in the episode. So somebody had to put music on it. I think it's most likely Pam. She's setting up the iPod at reception. She plugs it into her PC, puts the card aside somewhere, then walks with Roy to the kitchen with Daryl. They're in the kitchen. Daryl's getting some ice. And then they start talking about fantasy football. This is the moment that Pam gets bored. It's more important to recognize this scene as a moment of boredom as opposed to a moment of guilt. Yes, Pam feels fleetingly guilty throughout the episode, but not enough to trade that iPod. It's in this moment she gets bored of the fantasy football discussion and decides to read the card. So the card is read post-kitchen scene away from Roy. We know Roy and Daryl ended up staying in the kitchen until the shots started to get poured out. So Pam leaves the kitchen, goes to reception. Now around that time at reception, Michael has everybody's attention with a digital camera. So she goes behind a desk and she reads the card. Now that's the final building block in our mind map. Now there are a lot of moving parts, task force, and there are a number of moments in the photos and the video footage, which we haven't covered, but we're going to address them as we put this story together. Now before we hypothesize a series of events, I want to let everyone know that this is the what and the how, but it is isn't the why. Why all this has happened is going to have to be covered in another episode because as we get deeper into this investigation, you'll notice that the intricacies and the story become complex and the character interactions become very specific. So what the hell really happened? The story goes something like this. Jim decides to open up to Pam about his apparent bisexual conflicting feelings. He writes in the card that he's feeling mixed up, he knew her was gay since high school, but since they've been spending a lot of time together, now he thinks he finds both men and women attractive. He wants to have sex with Pam. This now taps into Pam's childhood trauma and Pam's need for sexual affirmation. Because as we discussed in part one of Gay Jimothy, Pam is actually 
literally the ghost of Hattie McGonigal. Michael throws Jim's plan into disarray as he institutes Yankee Swap under duress. The teapot, card and box get passed around until Dwight finally gets it. Pam couldn't care less about the teapot, she wants the iPod. Dwight on the other hand couldn't care less about the iPod, he wants the teapot. A very strange choice. We observe the card still in the box when Dwight gets the teapot gift. Yankee Swap ends and then Michael goes to the bottle shop to buy vodka. Dwight gives the card to Pam. This is why it's at the bottom of the iPod document stack. She had those two elements together, walks over to reception, opens up the iPod first and puts the card on the bottom of the stack for later. Pam doesn't want to read the card in front of Roy, so she sets up the iPod, plugs it into her computer and starts to load songs onto it. She then moves to the kitchen with Roy and Daryl. Roy and Daryl start discussing fantasy football. Pam gets bored and decides to walk back to reception to read the card. Everyone around reception is distracted by Michael and his digital camera so she's able to read the card in private. She realizes it's a gay confession card. This has triggered her psychological trauma and her need for sexual affirmation but at the same time she's unsure what to do about the situation. So she unplugs the iPod, puts it on the bench and she takes the open card to Dwight for him to have a look at. Dwight reads the card and then a discussion unknown to us occurs. What we do know, however, is although Pam and Dwight wanted their respective gifts, the card has now forced the trade. There is some nefarious reason why they want to keep this a secret. It is in their interests for Jim not to know that either Pam or Dwight have in fact read the card. It likely links them to some form of culpability in the triple homicide in season one. One. So the plan's decided. She walks back to reception with the open card. However, now a number of people have gathered in that vicinity. If you look at the footage in slow motion, you'll notice that Pam is in fact holding the card. Her arms are raised to her side and in her right hand, she's holding Jim's open card. She grabs the iPod box with her left hand and she slides the card into the box. If you look at this moment in the video footage, you can see her sort of sliding it in with her thumb and we do actually have one of Michael's photos with the box and with the card just visible at the edge. So Pam is unable to reseal the card at reception. Firstly, at the beginning of the episode she only had green envelopes. The stationary shelf is on the opposite side of the office. At this point, Jim and Oscar get up off the couch and join the party. Why? We're now taking shots. Everybody wants a shot of vodka so everybody's gotten up for the DJ generacy to begin. Whilst everybody's distracted with taking shots of vodka, Pam and Dwight trade the iPod, which we've now established is clearly unboxed. But the fact that the card is in the iPod box is why Pam still has Dwight's attention. She gives him the iPod, she takes the teapot, and then she tells him, we still need to reseal this card. So whilst everyone is distracted, they walk to the stationery shelf, they get another envelope, Dwight places the card in the envelope, reseals it and labels it, but this time he doesn't write Pam, he writes Pammy. He does this to throw off Jim just in case Jim notices that it has in fact been opened. Pam walks behind the cameraman and makes her way back to reception. She places the relabeled and resealed card next to her and she sits at reception waiting to draw Jim's attention. During this time, a number of other staff members notice that she's sitting down by herself. Angela and Kelly pop over to the desk to see if she's okay because she's not joining the party. She's been sitting there for quite a while. Finally, Jim notices and he makes a comment to her. You know, you don't have to answer calls during a party. Um... Just thought you should know. So she manages to draw Jim's attention. Jim then sees the relabeled card, decides to take it back. Now this is a moment where I'll give you a hypothesis for why he took it back. When everybody's around reception, when Pam makes her way back with the card after having shown Dwight, you'll notice that Jim and Oscar are sitting on the couch together. Now guys, let's just be honest. This moment is super gay. Jim isn't even sitting in the middle of his seat. I mean, it's a three-seat 
Peter Cash. They could have sat on opposite ends, but Jim is really closely hugged up next to Oscar. And the current hypothesis is that Jim got jaded, that Pam didn't take the teapot, and then organizes a sexual dalliance with Oscar after the Christmas party. And I want to point out to you guys, when Yankee Swap ends, it's already 7.30. You can see this from Michael's photos, right? So by this stage in the episode, it's got to be at least, I don't know, I'd say at least 9 o'clock, possibly even pushing 10 p.m. So Jim takes the card back. 